Best 10 Must Read Books, that was released in November 2020. The Best of Me by David Sedaris For more than 25 years, David Sedaris has been carving out a distinctive literary space, almost creating his own genre. A Sedaris history may appear confessional, but is also highly attuned to the earth outside. It opens our eyes from what reaches absurd and moving about our daily existence, which is almost impossible to learn without laughing. Now, for the first time collected in one volume, the writer brings us his funniest and most memorable work. In these testimonies, Sedaris shops for unconventional taxidermy, hitchhikes with a lady quadriplegic, and spits a lozenge into a fellow traveler's lap. He drowns a mouse in a bucket, problems to state give it if you ask me in five languages, and hand feeds a carnivorous bird. The Harpy by Megan Hunter Lucy and Jake stay in a house with a field where in fact the sun burns just like a ball of fire. Lucy has placed her career besides to be able to devote her life to the kids, with their finely tuned routine, also to the home itself, which comforts her as an old, sly friend. But a guy calls one afternoon with a shattering message, his wife has been having an affair with Lucy's husband, Jake. The revelation marks a turning point, Lucy and Jake opt to stay together, but make a particular arrangement made to even the score and save their marriage she will hurt him 3x. As the couple submit to a delicate game of crime and punishment, Lucy herself starts to improve, surrendering to a transformation of both body and mind from which there is absolutely no return. Told in dazzling, musical prose, The Harpy is a dark, staggering storybook, simultaneously mythical and otherworldly and fiercely modern. It really is a novel of love, marriage and its failures, of power, control and revenge, of metamorphosis and renewal. Rhythm of War by Brandon Sanderson After forming a coalition of human resistance from the enemy invasion, Dalinar Colon and his Knights Radiant have spent each year struggling a protracted, brutal war. Neither aspect has gained an edge and the risk of a betrayal by Dalinar's crafty ally Teravangian looms over every tactical move. Now as new technological discoveries by Navani Colon scholars commence to change the facial skin of the war, the enemy prepares a bold and dangerous operation. The arms competition that follows will challenge the very core of the radiant ideals, and potentially reveal the secrets of the ancient tower that was once the heart of their strength. At the same time that Kaladin Stormblessed must come to grips with his changing role within the Knights Radiant, his Windrunners face their own problem, as more and more deadly enemy fused awaken to wage war, no more honorspren are willing to bond with humans to increase the number of Radiants. Adulene and Shallan must lead the Coalition's envoy to the honorspren stronghold of lasting integrity and either convince the Spren to join the cause against the evil god Odium, or personally face the storm of failure. White Ivy by Susie Young Ivy isn't your typical heroine. She's acquired a bit of any honesty problem and she wants to steal. When I transformed the pages of the excellent debut, I came across myself rooting for Ivy the complete way. But that didn't mean I usually liked or arranged with her alternatives. We meet Ivy when she's an adolescent, determined to match into the white Protestant suburban community where she's growing up. A kid of the Chinese diaspora, Ivy strives to get the glamorous life she affiliates with the American dream no subject what must be done. Her obsession with assimilation culminates in a plot to be friends with her crush Gideon, who epitomizes everything sparkly about suburban wealth. Externally, he and his family may actually own it all. However when Ivy reunites with him as a grown-up, cracks begin to surface in this perfect facade and in hers. White Ivy is a juicy and fun read with a shocking twist. It's a coming-of-age book that will business lead to conversations about otherness and ambition. On top of that it'll leave you with questions about how precisely and where we look for happiness, which feels as though an ever more pressing preoccupation in these hoping times. The Office of Historical Corrections by Danielle Evans In her title story, The Office of Historical Corrections, Danielle Evans imagines a global where our society's knowledge of reality is so fractured that people have a whole governmental agency to help us separate fact from fiction. If this appears like fantasy, 
consider how unreal simple fact has thought at so many occasions within the last couple of years. What I really like relating to this book is how it focuses how our perceptions of what's real clash with this convenience of honesty. Can we be genuine with ourselves? Who are we and what do we are a symbol of? In five brief stories and one novella, Evans shows us characters whose choices illuminate who they are. A young girl faces an impossible decision when she sees herself over a greyhound bus together with an abandoned guy. An actress haunted by her mother's medical battles reflects on her behalf own fraught experience of navigating her health. A school student enrages her classmates by refusing to reckon with why a viral public post of herself in a Confederate flag bikini offends. These experiences creatively show the daily requirements placed on women, specifically black women, and will be offering perception, compassion, and even occasions of dark humor. We Keep the Dead Clothes by Becky Cooper 1969, the height of counterculture and the year universities would seek to curb the unruly spectacle of student protest, the winter that Harvard University would start the tumultuous process of merging with Radcliffe, its all-female sister college, and the year that Jane Britton, an ambitious 23-year-old graduate pupil in Harvard's anthropology division and daughter of Radcliffe Vice President J. Boyd Britton would be found bludgeoned to death in her Cambridge, Massachusetts apartment. Forty years later, Becky Cooper, a curious undergrad, will hear the first whispers of the story plot. Within the first showing the body was nameless. The story plot was this, a Harvard learner had possessed an affair with her professor, and the professor possessed murdered her in the Peabody Museum of Archaeology and Ethnology because she'd threatened to speak about the affair. Although rumor proves incorrect, the storyline that unfolds, the one which Cooper will observe for a decade, is even more technical, an account of gender inequality in academia, a cowboy culture among empowered male elites, the silencing aftereffect of companies, and our compulsion to rewrite the stories of girl victims. We Keep Carefully the Dead Clothes is a memoir of mirrors, misogyny, and murder. It really is simultaneously a rumination on the violence and oppression that rules our revered companies, a ghost story reflecting one young woman's earlier onto another's present, and a love story for a woman who was simply lost to history. A Promised Land by Barack Obama Inside the stirring, highly anticipated first level of his presidential memoirs, Barack Obama tells the storyline of his improbable odyssey from son searching for his identity to leader of the free world, describing in strikingly personal detail both his political education and the landmark occasions of the first term of his historic presidency a time of dramatic transformation and turmoil. Obama removes readers over a compelling voyage from his earliest political aspirations to the pivotal Iowa caucus victory that demonstrated the energy of grassroots activism to the watershed nights November 4, 2008, when he was elected 44th President of America becoming the first dark-colored to carry the nation's highest office. Reflecting on the presidency, he offers a distinctive and thoughtful exploration of both awesome reach and the limits of presidential vitality, as well as singular insights into the dynamics of U.S. partisan politics and international diplomacy. Obama brings readers inside the Oval Office and the White House Situation Room and Moscow, Cairo, Beijing, and tips beyond. We could aware of his thoughts as he assembles his cabinet, wrestles with a worldwide financial crisis, removes the way of measuring Vladimir Putin, overcomes seemingly insurmountable odds to secure passing of the affordable health care function, clashes with generals about U.S. strategy in Afghanistan, tackles wall membrane block reform, responds to the devastating Deepwater Horizon blowout, and authorizes procedure Neptune's spear, which brings about the death of Osama bin Laden. A Promised Land is extraordinarily intimate and introspective the report of one man's guess with record, the faith of an community organizer tested on the earth level. Obama is candid about the balancing act of running for office as a black American, bearing the expectations of a generation buoyed by messages of hope and change, and meeting the moral challenges of high-stakes decision-making. He is frank about the forces that opposed him at home and abroad, open about how living in the White House affected his wife and daughters, and unafraid to reveal self-doubt and disappointment. Yet he never wavers from his belief that inside the great, ongoing American experiment, progress is always possible. 
this beautifully written and powerful book captures Barack Obama's conviction that democracy is not a gift from on high but something founded on empathy and common understanding and built together, day by day. Before the Coffee Gets Cold by Tashikaza Kawaguchi In a small back alley in Tokyo, there is a cafe which has been serving carefully brewed coffee for more than 100 years. But this coffee shop offers its customers a unique experience, the chance to travel back in time. In Before the Coffee Gets Cold, we meet four visitors, each of whom is hoping to make use of the cafe's time-traveling offer, in order to, confront the man who left them, receive a letter from their spouse whose memory has been taken by early-onset Alzheimer's, to see their sister one last time, and to meet the child they never got the chance to know. But the journey into the past does not come without risks, customers must sit in a particular seat, they cannot leave the cafe, and finally, they must return to the current before the coffee gets cold. Tashikaza Kawaguchi's beautiful, moving tale explores the age-old question, what could you change if you could travel back in its history? More importantly, who you want to meet, maybe for just one last time. Ready Player Two By Ernest Klein I've always noticed pretty secure in my own nerdy identity, but even I'd not want to handle off against Ernest Cline in pop culture trivia. But despite my limited understanding of obscure video gaming and John Hughes movies, I came across myself tearing through Ready Player Two at warp speed, gleefully geeking from the immersive worlds of iconic 20th century classics. After becoming the heir to game maker James Halliday's vast estate, Wade Watts finds that fame and wealth have, shockingly, not solved all his problems. As his personal relationships get started to crumble, Wade discovers a revolutionary new technology that Halliday left out, a device which makes the alluring escapism of the digital world more potent and more dangerous than ever before. Much like its predecessor, Ready Player Two is filled up with heart and soul and action and 80s references galore. On top of that, you don't have to be a Tolkien or D&D fanatic to take pleasure from the novel's faceted characters, fascinating quest narrative, or give attention to human resilience. You don't have to be a nerd to fall deeply in love with the earth Ernest Cline has built but it really helps. The 30 Names of Night By Zane Jakotter Five years after a suspicious fire killed his ornithologist mother, a closeted Syrian-American trans boy sheds his birth name and searches for a new one. He has been unable to paint since his mother's ghost has begun to visit him each evening. As his grandmother's sole caretaker, he spends his days cooped up in their apartment, avoiding his neighborhood masjid, his estranged sister, and even his best friend, who also happens to be his longtime crush. The only time he feels truly free is when he slips out at night to paint murals on buildings in the once thriving Manhattan neighborhood known as Little Syria. One night, he enters the abandoned community house and finds the tattered journal of a Syrian American artist named Layla Z, who dedicated her career to painting the birds of the United States. She famously and mysteriously disappeared more than 60 years before, but her journal includes proof that both his mother and Layla Z encountered the same rare bird before their deaths. Actually, Layla Z's past is intimately linked with his mother's and his grandmother's in ways he never could have expected. Even more surprising, Layla Z's story reveals the histories of queer and transgender people within his own community that he never knew. Realizing that he isn't and has never been alone, he has the courage to officially claim a new name, Nadir, an Arabic name meaning rare. As unprecedented numbers of birds are mysteriously drawn to the New York City skies, Nadir enlists the help of his family and friends to unravel what happened to Layla Z and the rare bird his mother died trying to save. Following his mother's ghost, he uncovers the silences kept in the name of survival by his own community, his own family, and within himself, and discovers the family that was there all along. Featuring Zane Jakotter's signature magical and heart-wrenching, the Christian Science Monitor, storytelling, The Thirty Names of Night is a timely exploration of how we all search for and ultimately embrace who we are. Thank you for watching. Please. Don't forget to like, comment, share this video and subscribe to my channel.